How's everybody doing? <laughs> Great. You know, we've got an audience in the room and extended out there. I don't know where the far reaches of our the audience are today, but I know that there's plenty online that are joining us. First of all, it's our pleasure to welcome you to our sixth annual economic forum again. You know, we've we've started this a few years ago in Downey, and it has sort of grown to become a something that we all look forward to. So. I, I appreciate the fact that you're making time to be here personally and also by extension through the Zoom setup. Uh, I'm Nader Magadam, President and CEO of Financial Partners. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being in this role for the last 18 years. And I can say that every time I have a chance to tell the story of Financial Partners, it always gives me great pleasure that, you know, a few people back in 1937, eight, 85 years ago, came together. They were co-workers and it was right after the recession. They couldn't find good savings places or good places to borrow. They got their meager resources together and started a credit union. That credit union today, 85 years later, is 86,000 members strong and over one $2.1 billion in assets. I don't think they would have dreamt that one day, 85 years later, we're going to still be singing their praises and thank them for the good work that they did. But it sort of goes to show that when people pool their resources and and put their imagination to work, great things can happen. You know, uh, we operate 21, 20 offices throughout the state of California today, ranging from South San Francisco and all the way down in Mission Valley and San Diego. Most of our branches are in obviously Orange County and LA. What's interesting is we're operating out of two administrative centers, one in Downey and the other one in Costa Mesa. Downey, we've been there since inception. And in Costa Mesa, we've been here a couple of years now, and we've got it, you know, in this day and age where you're in distributed form, you know, we're sort of in distributed form in, in Southern California at this point in time. See, what really gives me great pleasure is a couple of things have happened over the time, over the last couple, couple of years. One is that Orange County Register has recognized, recognized us as a top place to work. The American Banker has recognized us among the best credit unions to work for. And most recently, Forbes uh, recognized us as the best in state credit union. And what also gives me great pleasure is National Credit Union Association, uh, in, I'm sorry, CUNA Credit Union, no, CUNA, CUNA Credit Union National Association, which does a little bit of a, a survey every year to measure uh, uh, certain factors about credit unions, has recognized us as one of the credit unions that creates get best value for the members. According to their data, our members on average, make about $470 more uh, economic value than they, they would at a financial other financial institution. And to put that in perspective, that's about $19 million a year. So we're basically staying true to our calling, which was a not-for-profit uh, organization, a cooperative, where if you're a member, you're also an owner. So we, we appreciate all those 86,000 members who are, who are, who are working, who are, who are employing us. Now, as we're moving forward, I know that you're not here to hear about the credit union's history, but you're here to see the man of the hour, Chris Thornburg. He's a great friend of the credit union. I know that you've got his background in terms of being the founding member of Beacon Economics and also being the uh, the guru of uh, you know economics at UC Riverside, if I may. And 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 I think that I've uh, grown really fond of seeing him in action about 16 17 years ago and ever since for the last 15 years we've had a real close collaboration where he's helped our board and our management team really focus on economic issues with that i'm going to basically turn it to my good friend chris please come on up sir. you know when you when you Work with a credit union this long, they get to know you. And so, for example, Lori turned on the beer for me. <laughs> uh, how do I describe? I mean, it's interesting. We've done this any number of years. It has been uh, a very interesting period of time. We've talked a lot about what I would call my broad level views, where our economy came from, a uh, world of miserableism, if you remember the term I would use on this. And that miserableism turned into one of the most chaotic and insane outpourings of stimulus we've ever seen. And now when you get right down to it, we're on the back end of that. And, and the big question, of course, is, is what is going on right now? And really, uh, the two major options are either it's a deflating bubble or it's a, a deflating bubble or a stimulus hangover, right? 
Now, those sound similar, but they're not. And indeed, when you look at this economy today, and I listen, I appreciate the pressure points. Mortgage rates are getting really close to 7%. And interday trading, they were over 7%. Uh, in the last couple of days, they have gone over that particular mark. Uh, you've heard, obviously, the pain consternation in the housing sector. You are hearing all sorts of conversations about uh, a recession that may have already happened. Um, we did have two quarters of negative growth this year, the beginning of the year. But let's take a step back. I, I just let me let me start this entire presentation with what I would call some of the most bizarre pairings of statistics hmm. I could possibly show you, right? I mean, this is a weird economy. There's no other way of putting it. I've done this for over 20 years, and I've looked at the history of the United States, in some cases going back to the 20s or the 10s of last century. You've never seen anything like this. For example, again, we just, by the way, we just got... Um, the GDP, the third quarter GD, uh, third GDP release for the revisions, and I expected them to be bigger than they were. No, it's the real deal. The first half of this year, our economy contracted. Now, there is a, what I would call a very simplistic definition of a recession is two quarters of negative growth. That's nonsensical. No true economist would ever define a business cycle so tritely. But more to the point, how often have we had two quarters of negative growth when the unemployment rate's been basically stuck below 4%? One of the tightest labor markets in 50 years. That doesn't happen. What's going on there? Or you have, of course, a complete collapse in U.S. consumer sentiment. In fact, consumer sentiment right now is the worst it's ever been, according to the University of Michigan survey, almost as bad as it was back in 1980, slightly worse than it was in the middle of the Great Recession. So consumer confidence is absolutely plummeting right now. But why? I just showed you the unemployment rate. By the way, where do we get to the earnings numbers? Earnings growth right now is at a 40-year high at this particular point in time. And to be clear, what are people upset about? Consumer spending has completely bounced back and it's back on, I mean, indeed, a little bit above the trend it was on pre-pandemic. I don't exactly understand what people are complaining about from a quality of life perspective. From any basic metric, quality of life at your typical American household is basically the best it's ever been. Why are people so angry? And then of course you have the housing market, which I already told you is going into this free fall. Uh, right now we have 11 months supply of new homes for sale in the US, which by the way is almost as high as it was in, in 2009 when the market fell apart in the midst of the great recession. But to be clear, we have three months supply of existing homes for sale, which outside the last year and a half is the tightest existing home market we've ever seen. Again, huh? What, I mean, how do you, what do you make of these statistics? They don't make any sense. And even on the inflation front, yes, the highest inflation in 40 years, interest rates are going up, perhaps not too surprisingly. But, you know, I have to keep pointing out to people as much as nominal interest rates have come up, they haven't come up as much as. Inflation has. Indeed, real interest rates, which, you know, for well over 100 years, economists have noted that the real interest rates was really important here. That, of course, is nominal interest rates minus inflation. That's negative. I mean, if you borrow a one-year T-bill in real terms, in terms of the, the consumption you have to give up, you're actually, it's a negative interest rate. If you borrowed $100 today, you get real terms at the end of the year, you have to give back about $97. Well, that's not bad <laughs> when you think about it, right? So, you know, we're freaking out about nominal rates, but actually they're pretty low in real terms, and that's the appropriate number. So, what is going on? Now, a lot of it, of course, all boils down to, again, the insane actions of the Federal Reserve and Congress over the last couple of years. The story starts with a ridiculous forecast of a depression stemming from this pandemic, which was never going to happen. There's not one shred of historical evidence 
that would ever lead you to the conclusion that a pandemic would cause a depression. Not one, but that's what the entire, for not the entire, I was not, <laughs> but so many of these talking heads that dominate the beltway, that bubble called DC, all screamed into the world. And we had in the midst of these crazy populist, miserable times, an insane amount of stimulus hitting the economy. And we're now at the back end of that. Now, where is the economy right now? Are we in a recession? Are we heading into a recession? No, 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 no we're not. No, no, not a chance. Look, a real definition of a recession is very simple. It's a period of time when the economy is performing below what it could perform at. It's a period of time defined by excess capacity. People want jobs, can't find them. Unemployment is high. Factories have the ability to produce goods, but no one wants to buy them. Capacity utilization is low. That's not happening in our world today. Yes, GDP is going down, but it's not a problem, obviously, of excess capacity driven by some broad market failure. Rather, there are pressure points on certain parts of the economy, yet the rest of the economy is doing just fine. It's a very weird, bifurcated economy. The reason for that, yet again, goes down to, and I will say this as, as nicely as possible, the fact that the Federal Reserve Board is run by a pack of either idiots or lunatics. <laughs> Because what they have done over the last two years is completely inconceivable. Let's understand. Let me, let me just give you the upshot of what they are trying to do right now, what they've done, what they're trying to do. Stimulus, and I'll come back to the data on this and I'll back it up. But the stimulus efforts we're talking about here is $6.5 trillion of fiscal stimulus. That is to say, federal government spending driven by massive amounts of public borrowing. $6.5 trillion of money they just poured onto the economy, just fire hosed it, massive amounts, multiple times any true economic losses. They just sprayed massive quantities of money across the entire economy. And by the way, that money is still sitting out there. Where do I show you some of the, the cash balances in our economy today? There's massive quantities of money. Well, all that money is generating inflation. Of course it is. Inflation, by the way, is nothing more complicated but the situation when there's too much money chasing too few goods. That's all it is. And that's what's driving inflation. So how are they trying to take care of inflation? They're cranking interest rates up. Wait, what? You put buckets of water of money all over the economy here, which is creating too much demand across the entire economy. And now you want to slow everything down just by cranking back on interest rates which is only hitting the interest rate sensitive parts of the economy. So in other words, they took the entire train and they accelerated it, but they're trying to slow the train down just with a couple cars. Well, that's not stable. Trains tend to go off the tracks when you do that, right? And it's kooky. You know, it's funny. I got to write, so I haven't written this. I'm going to do an NNE post on this, but I'm going to write an NNE post that basically starts out with this little metaphor, which is truly true. Where I lived as a little kid, we had a hill in front of our house. And I remember my buddy and I were riding our bikes around. We had got top of the hill. We were coming down the hill. And a big dog ran right in front of my buddy. Now, he's coming down the hill. He's going pretty fast. And he hit his brakes. But he made the fatal mistake of only hitting his front brakes. Oh. <laughs> you know where that goes, right? Oh, it went off. And, of course... By the way, the damage he did to himself going over the front of the over the front of the handlebars was far worse than anyone happened had he just fallen over, you know, dodging the dog or even hitting the damn dog. The dog was huge; wouldn't hurt the dog. <laughs> uh, but the point here, of course, it isn't just that you're breaking; it's how you're breaking that's important. And in this particular case, how the Fed is trying to break the economy is completely stupid relative to how they accelerated it. Now. What should they be doing? The answer is absolutely nothing. What's the best way of getting rid of all this excess cash flowing around the U.S. economy? Inflation. Inflation is its own cure. The money will get absorbed. Sit in your hands. Do nothing. 
But instead, they just keep cranking it up and cranking it up. And they're creating a lot of pains in small portions of the end of the economy. And that pain is going to grow worse. Is that pain enough to put the entire U.S. economy into recession? No, not yet. Not yet. So what they should be doing is sitting on their hands and they're not. Now, housing, of course, is front and center on this. There's no more interest rate sensitive sector than real estate. Housing, of course, is part of that. Again, a lot of consternation. I started this week out giving talks to the Pacific Coast Builder Conference. And there were the two things that I found really interesting about the Pacific Coast Builder Conference. A, everybody was depressed. And B, everybody was busy. <laughs> but again, remember. What they're dealing with is still supply shortages. There's still things happening. They're still going to work on a day-to-day -day basis. But the writing's on the wall. The market is cooling very quickly. How bad will it get? Well, they think it's going to be the end of the world. And yet again, the same cast of clowns, Ivy Zellman, Mark Sandy, uh, Nuriel Rubini, all these guys are up there screaming end of the world again. And they're all panicking. But the reality is housing is not going to collapse. This isn't 2006. The fundamentals of housing are phenomenal. But the cost of housing is going through the roof. And there's a big sticker shock going on. Again, how that shakes out remains to be seen. Now, ultimately, I don't think we're going to have a recession in the next year. The Fed's doing a lot of damage to portions of the economy. And we're going to suffer from that. But on the other side of it, particularly when it comes to consumers, consumer demand is still incredibly strong. There's still a tremendous amount of pent-up consumer demand that will stabilize and continue to move the economy forward over the course of the next year. It just will. But with that in mind, there are going to be points in pain. And I'm afraid to say this, a lot of those points of pain are going to be in the lending industry. Again, there's going to be a big sticker shock with any kind of borrowing. And, and how you deal with that, how you navigate that, whether you're a builder or a bank, well, that's going to be complicated over the next couple of years. So, you know, it's going to be a bumpy ride. But the real issues we face out there are not the issues we're talking about here. Because the fundamentals of the private sector are very good, even if we're going on a very bumpy path. The real problem here, of course, is where, why? The private sector is so healthy, which is because we replaced a whole bunch of private sector debt with public sector debt. We borrowed $60,000 for every single person in this country since 2000. Of that $60,000, our federal government has borrowed $20,000, $20,000 for every single person in this country in the last two years. We're coming out of this with a trillion and a half dollar structural budget deficit, which no one in DC even cares about. They don't talk about it, they don't think about it. It doesn't seem to matter to anybody. Well, you know, the problem with that is debt doesn't matter until it does. And when it does, they could get very, 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 very ugly very, very quickly. Now, when's that gonna happen? Probably not anytime in the near future. If by nothing else, judging by the value of the U.S. dollar, which is through the roof. But yeah, again, it, 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 there is these large outstanding long run issues that are not sustainable and we're not even talking about. So it's going to be an interesting couple of years in front of us. And out there, some point on the horizon is this enormous fiscal challenge. What comes between those? Well, you're just going to have to keep inviting me back as long as you stop being so cheap and get us back to Monarch Beach, according to my wife. So. <laughs> All right. So that's that's the big picture. Um, now, let's get into it, as always. By the way, I should also point out by saying, uh, if you have questions as we're going through this, you don't have to wait to the end where we know each other well. Raise your hand, ask questions. If I think you're, if we need to get moving, I'll tell you as much, okay, as the case may be. Um, but more or less, what I have here from here on out is more bit, every, backing up everything I just told you. Mm. And of course, starting with the, the where, where we were two years ago, the U versus V debate. And again, the follow on issue of, of beware the narrative. You know, I, I think I've, I've had this conversation with you before, so I won't, I won't belabor the point. But, you know, I was calling this last 
decade, the decade of miserabilism. I was confused because the stories I was reading in the paper, the stories that were coming out of our politicians' mouth didn't match anything I was seeing in the data. Now, it's not supposed to work that way. In, in, the, in the world of, of, you know, monetary, I'm sorry, in the world of mathematical economics, the world is rational. We spend a lot of time and effort talking about how rational expectations impact the economy, and yet icy conversations that seem completely out of line with the data, which doesn't make any sense to me. Well, then Robert Schiller reads, read, read, writes this great book, Narrative Economics, and he just points out that the history of business cycles is littered with divergences between the narrative and the reality. So there's nothing new here. It's just a continuation of the same kind of what I would call crazy cycles, as opposed to, I don't know, productivity cycles or business cycles. These are crazy cycles. And in a very real sense, we always have to be aware of the narrative. Now more than ever, this hasn't changed. Now, the pandemic, as tragic as it was, was never going to be a depression. Um, it was going to be a V, largely because it was a different kind of shock. It was a supply shock, not a demand shock. Remember, a demand shock, great recession, classic demand shock. Problem starts, 2006, I'm rich, 2008, damn, I'm not. All right, very simple. You have to save. Everybody's saving. The economy can't grow. You get stuck in that vicious cycle. This time around, didn't happen at all. What happened in 2020 was completely different than 2010. 2010, you didn't go to restaurants because you couldn't afford to. 2020, you didn't go to restaurants because you weren't allowed to. Why is that different? The money you didn't spend on the restaurant either got spent now on goods or was saved to be spent on restaurants later. It was not demand canceled. It was demand transferred or delayed. It wasn't that big of a deal. But they didn't treat it that way. They lost their minds. They started screaming depression. And the result of that, of course, was this massive outpouring of stimulus. Now, here we are again. So in these crazy things, consumer confidence is down, economic hurricane, Zandy, full-blown stocks have entered a bear market, gas is $6 a gallon. Ah! end of the world. But again, does this look like a recession? Unemployment remains at 3.8% right now. It came up one-tenth of a, of a percent. Job openings right now, the job openings rate is still about 10 million. We still have one of the highest levels of job openings to unemployed we've ever seen in the 25 plus years we've been collecting data on job openings. Industrial production is at an all-time high level. Industrial capacity back to an all-time high level. This is not a recessionary economy. This is an economy that seems to be in the aggregate moving forward about as fast as it possibly can. And even in terms of GDP, we did indeed have these negative numbers. These are the numbers as of this morning. Negative 1.6% in Q1, negative 0.6% in Q2. But actual demand, final demand, growth in spending by consumers, businesses, and government, those are actually positive this year. So we have actually have seen continued increases in spending. It's just that our economy isn't making it. Well, where it's coming from is through this big increase in the trade deficit we saw in the first quarter of the year, and that closed a bit in the second quarter. But at the same time, we had a big runoff of inventories. So we're buying lots of stuff. We're just not making it. So it, that's the kind of issue here. There's still growing demand, although it's slowing quite a bit. How could it not with these huge increases in interest rates? But again, it's, it's not a recession. Recessions, excuse me, typically start with a big pullback in demand that eventually hits supply. This time we're having problems with supply. Demand continues to grow. It's a different kind of pattern. It's a different kind of thing. And to be clear, demand would probably be even better than that if indeed we could meet the demand. If you guys do autos, right? You do auto loans. The auto sector is still nowhere near being caught up, right? Look at the numbers. Sales have been running. Sales are typically running 17 million a year. We've been operating over the last year about 14 million a year. So that's 3 million units not sold. Now, it's not because, again, of a lack of demand. It's because of a lack of supply. You can see that in domestic inventories. This is downloaded as this morning. This was this is data as of like a week ago. They, the, the, they updated this particular data on, on domestic auto inventories. Prior, back in 2017, there was 1.2 million automobiles for sale in the United States. Right now, it's still less than 100,000. 
So we know we will be selling more if we could just keep up with demand. That is not a recessionary economy by any stretch of the imagination. Still supply constraint. Now, things are starting to loosen up for better or for worse. For example, uh, the supply chain uh, pressure index that comes from the New York Fed, it's mainly based on container costs. Container costs are running 10K. They're not like 4K. They're still higher than the 1500 that was a container a couple years ago or 2000, but it is coming down. We don't have giant backlogs. You see a big increase in imports because stuff is finally starting to come into this country. By the way, this is another classic way of how I know this is not a recession. Every time you have a recession, imports tend to go down. Not this time. <laughs> imports have been nice and rising dramatically. This is not a recessionary economy. Simple as that. We are starting to catch up. As for the service sector, it is bouncing back relative to a couple of years. Not evenly. Recreational services is still down about 11 percent. Transportation services is still down about 9 percent. That's maybe mainly global flights. Um, other things are up pretty strongly in the service sector, are coming back a little bit. Um, but, you know, planes are busy. Who's flown lately? lately? Anyone? It's a mob scene out there, right? <laughs> we just came back. My wife and we had a couple of weeks and uh, we, we, went to, we went to the Greek islands, by the way. I can, should I just show you photos of Greek islands? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's packed. Ooh, absolutely packed. Absolute modesty. So people are traveling. People are having fun out there. There's no doubt about it. Hotels in the United States are cooling off. But it's interesting. Again, when you think about that, the reason for this, the, the reason that tourism is cooling off in the United States is we're going overseas again. What's a problem for the United States is they're not coming back here. Take a look. This is... This is foreign travel in the U.S. This is actually GDP numbers, so it's billions of, of dollars. Uh, and you can see, of course, the big, the big, the, typically a lot more people come here than us going overseas. We see a lot more spending of people here. Not now. Now it's actually more spending of Americans abroad than people here. And this is in part because places like China haven't reopened. They're not traveling again. It's hard for them to travel anyway. And part of it is the fact that the dollar so goddamn strong. It's not making it cheap to come to the United States right now. So there is some weakness here. But again, the little bit of weakness you're seeing hotels is only because everybody's going to Greece, as far as I can tell. <laughs> and remember, even then, despite that, that issue, there still was a, a big problem in leisure and hospitality and services in general, did most of the economy of these labor shortages. Uh, for example, prior to the pandemic, there was about 1.2 million job openings in, in leisure, uh, leisure, hospitality, and other services. Now it's about 2.2, 2.3 million uh, restaurants, hotels. They just can't get proper amounts of staffing right now. And here's some data showing you 2019 versus 2020, July 2022. This is job openings by sector. The only place where there are fewer job openings is actually in construction, which probably goes down to what's happening in the housing sector. But it's only down just a little bit. Look up here at healthcare, 2.8 months supply, uh, not a nine, I'm sorry, uh, rate, 2.8% job opening rate. Now it's a 9% job opening rate. In the healthcare industry, leisure, hospitality, 6.7 to 9.3, professional, 9%, logistics, 8%. Other service, oh my God, there's still too many job openings out there. All right. You just, you can't have a labor cycle with this many job openings. Where are the workers? Well, again, we've talked about this. This is basic demographics. There's nothing particularly complicated here. Boomers, families of 10 kids, they all have one kids, population pyramid turns into a population column. Now boomers are retiring. Labor force growth was already slowing tremendously. Remember, prior to the pandemic, we had a 3.5% unemployment rate, which is the lowest in 50 years. And no, it wasn't because of the wonderful economic policies of the last administration. Um, it's just a lack of bodies, no more, no less. Where are we right now? Well, um, again, a bunch of people retired. That was the big thing. The pandemic basically accelerated the underlying trend. It was there, it just got accelerated. But the numbers are pretty profound. Labor force just got back, just almost got back to where it was pre-pandemic. But just, you know, look, look what we're talking about here. You're wondering why economic growth in the United States is slowing down. Well, just take a look at the labor force numbers. I mean, in the last five years, we're running about a 0.5% growth. If you go back to the 80s, you're talking about a 1.7%, 1.8%. Growth in your labor force per year. In the last decade, it was running about 1.1, 1.2%. Now we're at like less than 0.5%. The labor force isn't growing. 
And labor is an incredibly important component of our ability to produce goods and services. The U.S. economy's actual ability to produce goods and services is slowing down very sharply simply because we don't have workers. This is a, the CBO's estimate of potential GDP, real GDP growth. And from their perspective, um, they're talking about, you know, really the best the U.S. can do over the next few years is less than 2% growth per year because of a lack of labor growth, labor supply growth. I mean, it's profound. It's, it's not a productivity conversation. It's not a technology conversation. You just can't grow that fast if you don't have your labor force that's growing. Now, by the way, I actually think they're being optimistic because this is based on population growth numbers. The last time the census did real population forecasts was 2017. Well, 2017, they were highly overestimating immigration, which has slowed down tremendously in part because of the last administration's unbridled antipathy towards immigrants. Now, of course, we had the situation with COVID, which is causing to burn off as well. And people yet again are not moving. I think it's going to be substantially worse. Labor shortages are going to end up being a critical issue of our economy over the course of the next couple of decades. It's, it's just the reality of things. And again, we're not talking about that. It's not any real conversation. No one's thinking about immigration reform, which is so desperately needed now more than ever before. Now, there are some upsides to this. One of the upsides, of course, is when there's not enough workers, earnings growth. Will up. And yes, take a look at the, on the left-hand side. That's median earnings growth. That goes back to 1983. We have never seen median earnings growth at this pace ever in 45 years. We have never seen median earnings growth grow at this particular level. And by the way, yes, even if you get rid of inflation, real inflation, PEC based inflation, not the CPI, which is over uh, overestimated. Yes, it, earnings growth is still positive, although not as positive as this. So earnings is going up. The other big thing, by the way, is that earnings growth by quartile, the bottom quartile earnings, is seeing the biggest increases right now. Income inequality is falling at a very rapid pace right now, which is not something we hear acknowledged anywhere in Sacramento. <laughs> as far as they're concerned, the, the, the fight for equality is still number one on the, on the agenda. And don't let data and knowledge and facts stand in the way of our crusade. Uh, it's nuts. Now, again, it's not, I'm not saying we need to get, we should get rid of our programs to help people, but give me a break. Yes, sir. This is household earnings, right? Not corporate this is work earnings. earnings. Oh, this is corporate earnings? Mm -hmm. Any, oh. Worker earnings. Yes, yeah. it's on a worker by worker basis. The Atlanta Fed does this. They use something called the Atlanta, Atlanta Fed Wage Tracker. And if you look at the current population survey, which is the monthly survey used for the unemployment, um, every person in the CPS is in it eight times. You're in for four months, out for eight months, in for four more months. And in the last month you're in the sample, they, you, they get all your income information. Well, what they do is the Atlanta Fed actually takes that data and basically connects them. So they can actually look at individual workers. How were you doing last year? How are you doing this year? You average that up and that's where that number comes from. So it really is based on honest to God, take home earnings for these various workers coming out of this data. This is about as good as it gets. Now again, think of that. There's a tremendous amount of new income at the bottom end of the, of the income distribution. And for credit unions who tend to work with lower income households, well, this gives you actually <laughs> A nice growing client base, right? There's a whole group of people out there who are reaching a level of financial maturity they weren't at 10 years ago. And there's opportunities there, opportunities for growth, as the case may be. Uh, as for regional labor markets, you know, I was reading some of the description and, and they were very clear. We don't need all the local yokel stuff. We just want to understand what the hell's going on in the economy, which is fair. I'm not even going to get too much dive into the data. I will tell you, California just got back to where it was pre-pandemic for the number of jobs. And we're finally patting ourselves and saying, ah, oh, we recovered. And then people are saying, well, Arizona's way ahead. Texas is way ahead. Your economy is terrible. And, you know, we have these, these ridiculous ranking games. Who's ahead? Who's behind? Who's better? Who's worse? And it doesn't matter where you go in this country. You're going to see help on in science. It's absolutely irrelevant. Labor force growth, labor supply. Is the only thing that matters right now. Unemployment rates, 
no point looking at them. Like comparing number of payroll jobs today to a couple of years ago, irrelevant. It's all about labor force. And if you look across California, this is one of our more recent numbers, you'll see that very clearly. Um, where are the fastest growing places out there? Well, this is growth in jobs from 19 to 22. Fastest growing places, the Inland Empire. Oh, sorry, uh, up 7.2%. Stockton up 6.6%, Sacramento up 3%, Fresno up 4.3%. But again, are these bad, these are great economies in Los Angeles and Ventura and Oakland are bad economies? No, not really. Again, it's about labor force. You've had labor force growth out there, ergo, you can have job growth. In places like LA and Orange County, the labor force has shrunk. A lot of people have retired. Ergo, hard to fill jobs in those particular economies. It's nothing but, of course, labor force, labor force, labor force. And ultimately, labor force is going to be the story of economic development in the next, over the next decade. Economic development is all about workforce. What do we do? How do we expand? How do we get more people to move here? Well, affordable housing, nice playgrounds, good school district, things like that, right? Different kind of conversation. Well, if I can't get people to move here, how else can I get more workers? How do you get your seniors to work? How do you get more women to participate in the workforce? Because female participation rates in the United States are the lowest among the developed world. By the way, also the case that the degree of public support for child care is the lowest in the United States among the entire developed world. I don't think those two facts are unrelated. And they're pretty much stacked on top of each other. Again, you want to get more people out of your existing workforce? Subsidize child care, which is a desperate need in our economy today. And of course, last but not least, productivity enhancements. How do we make more with fewer people? How do we help mom and pop businesses do that? Different kind of conversation. But again, it's not about jobs, jobs, jobs anymore. That is gone. As for California, it's been a housing story all the way around. Our labor force problems are more profound than the rest of the United States. The difference between us and the rest of the United States is very simple. Is in California, if you want more labor force growth, you simply build housing. Build it and they will come. Well, I mean, you guys have been here, Southern California, the, this summer, the rest of the nation has had the worst weather in history. We had a bad week. Remember, we had that bad week? <laughs> By the way, I was in Greece. Thanks. Uh, again, so our problem is pretty easy to solve if we're willing to solve it. We just don't want to. Now, again, all this chaos starts with this overstimulation. And remember, here's one of the basic metrics. According to the data, households suffered about $820 billion in economic harm, in lost income, as a result of the pandemic. For that trouble, they directly gave back American households $2.1 trillion. $2.1 trillion to replace $820 billion in losses. They replaced the rate of about 2.6 to 1. I mean, Keynes is spinning over in his grave. This is not. This is not fiscal stimulus. This is trying to buy an election. Period. I mean, it, it, the, the degree of overreach here is, is just insane. We've never seen anything like this. And, of course, how did they fund that? Because, you know, you don't put $6.5 trillion on your credit card, right? Where does that come from? If the federal government had truly gone out there and borrowed $6.5 trillion, you would have moved credit markets. But they didn't have to borrow it. Because the Fed was right there backing them up. You know, I, what's interesting here, you've all heard of, of modern monetary theory. Have you, have you heard about it referred to here and there? There are some kooky, that's a pleasant term for them economists out there who've been running around saying, oh, we, this is a great way of doing it. And how does this work exactly? We're not going to have government debt anymore. What you're going to do is the government's going to have an expenditure budget, and then we'll have taxes. And anything left over, any deficit, well, those are print money. <laughs> Simple, right? Very clean. Well, that's exactly what we did. It's exactly what we just did, because the Federal, Go Federal Reserve did $5 trillion in quantitative easing. 
In other words, they bought $5 trillion of bonds. In other words, of the $6.5 trillion in deficit spending, $5 trillion of that was funded by the printing of money. So more or less, they printed $5 trillion and just sprayed it across the entire economy. Again, an insane amount of cash to deal with what was not a crisis. It, when, when Ben Bernanke did quantitative easing back in the day, remember what they, he was dealing with, the worst financial crisis this nation had faced since 1930. That kind of financial crisis has deflationary effects. What causes a depression? It's not pandemics. A depression is a, a bad recession with deflation. The history of depressions over and over, you have a bad recession and you throw in deflation. Bam, there's your depression. It's a very simple formula. Ben Bernanke said, we have a bad recession, can't let it go into, into a depression. Ergo, I'm going to use quantitative easing to expand the money supply to prevent or offset those deflationary pressures of collapsing financial markets. And he did so. Three and a half trillion dollars of quantitative easing over about six years. Now, this guy came in, Jerome Powell, he came in and he did three trillion dollars in quantitative easing over lunch. Yeah. And then he did two trillion more over the next 24 months in the face of no financial crisis. There was no bank load charge offs. Home prices were going through the roof, not collapsing. There were no foreclosures, no bankruptcies, as opposed to back then when there were record numbers of them. There was no deflationary pressures. There was no financial crisis. Why did you do it? Why? The narrative, the political narrative. The Federal Reserve has been politicized. Look, in the 1950s, the Federal Reserve was part of the Treasury. And a lot of economists said, that's a bad idea. You don't want the Federal Reserve to be under the control of the president. And a bunch of economists went to Truman and got him to sign a law that took the Federal Reserve out of Treasury, made it an independent institution. And they said it was very clear. They said, what they were saying is we want the Federal Reserve to be manned by a bunch of incredibly boring people <laughs> who do nothing in life but understand monetary economics and banking. Just people you never want to have to your cocktail party, okay? <laughs> but who absolutely understand how to do this. But then, of course, 20, 25 years ago, the attacks have begun, and now the Federal Reserve Board is completely politicized. You're no longer selected to be on the Federal Reserve Board because you're a, a boring old monetary economist or a well-experienced banker. Now you're on there because you checked the box. Because you have the right political opinions, because you speak and live the narrative, not the reality. And lo and behold, the Federal Reserve is acting just like everybody else in D.C. is. Now, of course, what actually happens it doesn't matter what the narrative is, Mr. Powell. The realities of what you did are very obvious in the data. Ben Bernanke back in the day did three and a half trillion dollars of quantitative easing. Money supply growth was nice and steady. This guy did five and a half trillion when we didn't need it. And we have one of the largest expansions of M2 we've ever seen in our lives. We ever seen in the history of this country. We've never seen M2 grow like this in the United States of America. Oh, you've seen it happen in, I don't know, Weimar, Germany. Actually, it was a little faster than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, kookiness. Absolute cookiness. And what happens when you go through this? Well, I think I mentioned this last time I was with you guys, but I'll say it again. A wonderful book, Money Mischief by Milton Freeman, wrote it in 1983. It, you buy it on Amazon. There's no complicated math or graphs. It's a wonderful read. I learned more about monetary theory from that book than I ever did from my money and banking textbook in my grad school. Apparently, no one in the Federal Reserve has bothered to pick it up. <laughs> Because if they had, nothing that had happened over the last two years would be a surprise. All that money hits the economy, and we're not rational. We don't think in terms of, of nominal versus real. No one looks at the money supply. All that money lands on you, and you feel rich, baby. And you go to town. Put that money on there. What does it do? Money illusion. Interest rates drop. Asset prices take off. Spending and investment goes through the roof. It feels great. Until, of course, like every binge, <laughs> whether it's alcohol or whatever your 
substance choice is, eventually it wears off and you start with a hangover. The hangover in this case, of course, is when reality kicks in and prices start to go up and interest rates start to go up. And you suddenly have realized that what you've really done more than anything else is you created more demand than supply than the economy can actually supply. And now you got to re-equilibrate. Now, again, in the short run, it sure felt good, right? Six and a half trillion dollars of federal borrowing with five trillion dollars, basically, of quantitative easing behind it. What did you do? Kicked off one of the greatest accumulations of household net worth we've ever seen. $40 trillion in five years of new household net worth. $40 trillion. That's the feedback effect because of all the asset price increases we saw. And it's not just the rich. It isn't Jeff Bezos and company that made all the money. This is the wealth of the bottom 50%. Remember, bottom 50% are earners seeing the biggest pay increases right now. The bottom 50% from a wealth perspective have seen the biggest, the entire bottom 50% were worth about 2 trillion before. Now they're worth about four and a half trillion. The wealth in the bottom 50% still too low. We still have too much wealth inequality, but the increase has been spectacular. Over a hundred percent increase in the bottom end of the pyramid. So tons of money out there. By the way, now you know why rents are going up so rapidly. Not a big mystery. Now, with this in mind, of course, there's little surprise that the credit markets have been so clean. This is the New York Fed Consumer Credit Panel. You can see, again, how good these numbers are. Credit card delinquencies are down. Uh, uh, student loan delinquencies way down. Auto delinquencies, everything's down. Credit markets are still incredibly clean. And I don't see that changing anytime in the near future. Business as well, by the way. Debt to equity ratios are really low. This is... Commercial real estate delinquencies, C&I delinquencies, total loans and leases, the commercial. Great numbers across the board. The private sector, from a financial perspective, looks very, very clean. Simple as that. But we're in the midst of a binge. This is the bigger problem. Take, for example, the trade deficit. The trade deficit is now 5% of GDP. Remember, if I say the trade deficit is 5% of GDP, what that means is our nation is consuming 5% more than it's producing. How are we consuming more and we're producing? We're borrowing it from the rest of the world. And the critical world word there is borrow. Because at some point in time, they're going to want it back. Consumer spending as a percent of GDP. I mean, both of these are getting close to where they were in the run to the Great Recession. Now, in the run to the Great Recession, all this excessive spending was being funded by, of course, subprime debt. This time it's being funded by federal debt. So it's a different source of debt, but nevertheless, it is a debt-fueled spending binge. And again, those never end well, ever, ever, ever. And of course, the other side of it, inflation. Of course, again, as already noted, inflation is nothing more than the consequence of too much money chasing too few goods. It's happening in our economy right now. And the numbers keep going up. They came down just a little bit this last month. But the numbers are still rising. CPI is roughly 8%. CPI is not chain linked. The PC is a better metric. That's about 7% year over year, a little less than 7%. Whatever. Highest number in four years. It's not just us. Inflation is everywhere right now because most governments overdid it. It wasn't just the United States and the Federal Reserve. The European Central Bank overdid it. The Bank of Japan overdid it. So everybody's seeing some inflation at this particular point in time. But it's amazing because Again, the stories. How, what have you heard? I'll, we'll go into this in a second. But take gasoline. Everybody's been going on and on about how gasoline, it's how tragic it is. Oh, it's gone up so much. Oh, consumers are getting crushed by gasoline. Oh, it's a huge problem. And oh, inflation is going to slow down. Why? Well, because the oil markets are rebalancing and oil prices are coming down. So everything's going to be okay. Just, hang on a second. <laughs> Time out. Why are gasoline prices so high? Is it because of a small disruption in our oil supply and, and because of the issue with Russia and Ukraine? By the way, Russia, as far as I can know, is still selling oil. They're just not selling it to us. <laughs> They're selling it to other people. So the global market really isn't all that constrained. And then go to the next step. So here's the nominal price of gasoline. You know, in the pandemic, gas was running a little over $2 a gallon in the country. It got to five. And now it's coming back down again. But this is real spending on gasoline and other items. and. When prices went from here to here, energy consumption went from here to here. Oh, no, no, hang on. 
Remember supply and demand, right? If this is a supply problem, consumption should go down, not up. But if it's a big demand shock, well, now you see a big price increase and quantity going up. So this was being driven by demand, not by supply. And now, of course, the oil markets are loosening up and oil gasoline prices are coming down. All that excess consumption that was there spending it on gasoline is just going to go somewhere else in the economy and cause inflation over there. And it's funny because they can't seem to, and this is the response, right? And Gavin Newsom is now sending us our checks because we need more money. I mean, it's complete stupidity. It's so bizarre. Um, and a couple of things here, a, couple, a little bit of context, right? I've already told you about, for example, the fact that interest rates are negative. But even, even inflation, we keep hearing these stories. Consumers are being crushed by inflation. Consumers are being shattered by inflation. How long can consumers handle inflation? <laughs> whoa, whoa, okay? In the last year, we had 7% inflation on the back end of four years where inflation was about a percent and a half. What that means is over the last five years, consumer prices have come up about 15%. That's exactly where we were in 2006. By the way, in 1979, it was 50% in five years. So can we stop the whining? <laughs> Please? Just stop. Um, and of course, our government, right? Oh, it's, uh, it's supply chain issues. Oh. No, it's the federal deficit. No, it's it's greedy corporations. No, it's not enough manufacturing jobs. It's bad green energy policies. It's Mr. Putin's fault now. <laughs> what is the next? Saturn isn't aligned with Jupiter. But no, it's disco. It's making a comeback. That's the new host of Jeopardy. It's his fault or her fault, right? It, it's, it's stupidity. Mm -hmm. It's not supply. It's demand. Mm -hmm. But you can't say that. Remember, miserabilism, the narrative of decline. Both policies have devolved themselves. Their entire platform devolves to this. Your lives suck and it's their fault. <laughs> and in that world, you can't say out loud the truth, which is the reason we have inflation, is you're spending too much money. You can't say that in this world. And see... They're constantly being disappointed. They're constantly shocked when they say inflation's going to come down next month and it doesn't. Oh, oh what's going on? <laughs> well, if you can't acknowledge the reality, of course you're not going to see the truth and how to get out of it, right? Inflation is always an ever monetary phenomenon, period. You printed too much money and now price levels have to catch up with the money supply. And then you get this nonsense, right? The economic, this is the New York Times. And, and the stupidity in papers, right? Good morning. The government's plan to fight inflation could cost jobs and restrict wage growth. Actually, the government's plan to fight inflation must cost jobs and restrict wage growth. There's no other way of cooling off the economy. Right? So, again, they're talking about it being a bad thing. It's the only thing. Again, you can't acknowledge that. So what has the Federal Reserve to done? Well, remember, expanding its balance sheet like crazy. Ergo, to get rid of inflation, you know, they're going to shrink their balance sheet. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, they're going to crank up on the federal funds rate like crazy. It's now above 3%, which is the highest it's been since, you know, about 2008, when we were on the entry point in the Great Recession. They're talking about cranking it up more. You created inflation by pouring buckets of cold, hard cash on the economy. And now you're trying to slow inflation by cranking up the federal funds rate and restricting money supply flowing between different lending institutions. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, of course, yes, as inflation is kicking in, interest rates are coming up. It, markets are cooling off. That's part of what's happening right now, too. The S&P is coming down. They call it a bear market. It's not a bear market. When the market goes up by 60% and down by 25%, that's called a somewhat return to reality, not 
a bear market is. You know, uh, venture capital is cooling off. Uh, Bitcoin is still at 20K. At 20K more, it'll be back at its par value. We'll be right right by there. Um, you could, yes, obviously, financial markets are starting to deflate as well, as well they have to with the, with the stimulus coming off and rates coming up. But none of this is particularly serious. The big issue, of course, is the interest rate ricochet. And, and you, you know, right, the two-year is about 4%. The 10-year is getting close to 4%. We have an inverted yield curve, of course, on that particular front. And mortgage rates are getting close to 7%. These are the effects of, of policy and basically bond market fear of, of what's happening on a typical inflation front. Now, what should they do? Well, the question really is, is, is what will cause inflation to come to an end? And there's really two ways of going about doing it. One way to cause inflation to end is to take the money away from consumers and businesses where it's all sitting. Now, the only way of doing that, by the way, is raising taxes. And they're not going to do that. OK, so ergo, maybe what you should do is nothing. You remember, inflation is its own cure. By my reckoning, we got about 15 to 25 percent more increases in prices. And then the money supply will re-equilibrate with the size of the economy. And then inflation will basically cool off to a normal level. You know, this is not the 1970s. The 1970s. You had year after year after year of higher and higher inflation because year after year after year after year, they were increasing M1 by too much. So it was an annual bad decision. OK, in this particular case, the Federal Reserve made a very bad decision in about a 19, 20 month period when they did the five trillion dollars in quantitative easing. But now they've stopped and now M2 is actually starting to come down just a bit which means there's no more problem with growing money supply. We now just have to let prices catch up. And by the way, prices catching up will actually fix this all by itself. So the simplest, least damaging thing they can do at this point in time is absolutely nothing. The worst thing you could do is just crank up short run interest rates and hurt interest rate sensitive parts of the economy while other parts of the economy, such as consumer spending on services, is still overheated because of the excess amount of cash. Now you're just torquing this economy in ways that the economy was never designed to be torqued. And you're creating pressures and problems and all the chaos you see around you today. Yes, sir. Given the chances of them doing nothing will never fly because it's politically the most costly answer, I suspect. Yeah. What's the second best thing they can do? There isn't. <laughs> they only have three choices, right? One is fiscal policy, which is never going to happen. Two is, oh, I mean, they could, well, the, what they could, the other thing they could do, of course, is, is do quantitative tightening, which they are starting to do right now, which is one of the reasons why I think the bond markets are responding. So, but yet again, do you really want them to try and fight this off now? We only have 15 to 20% excess inflation to go. That's it. Let it run out over three years. It's fine. It'll burn itself off. It'll be fine. Just leave it alone. The other thing they can do, if they really want to stop it right now, they could do quantitative tightening really seriously. And look what happens. These are real interest rates. Go back to the early 1980s. You want to know what caused inflation to go away in the 1980s? Is when he took interest rates were basically in real terms, that is to say, in uh, nominal rates minus inflation, running 0%, and they cranked them up to about 8%. Well, that, that'll slow down the economy. But you don't want that. No one needs that. That's really costly. I mean, they could cause a recession. They really could. It wouldn't be that bad because of all the excess cash flow around other parts of the economy. But do we really need that kind of damage, that kind of havoc in our financial system and our, our housing sector? Doesn't seem like a bright idea to me. It just seems like in this political season for the next couple of years. Yeah. Doing nothing won't be on anybody's appetite. And everyone wants to say I'm doing something. Yeah, I agree. Something yeah, well, that's and that's again. Yeah, I, I hear you. Listen, I, I, if, if you're, I'm telling you what they should do. What they will do is that's not my job. I can't forecast that. You're, that's like forecasting what a crazy person is going to say next. <laughs> if I do that, they wouldn't be crazy. Uh, just moving slightly from 
macro to micro, yeah. um, where we in the room have a little control. Um, on, on the, a few slides ago about corporate earnings and the stock market, do you have any insights on what kind of the average investor in the room should be doing these days? Stock market, index funds, bonds, real estate, any thoughts on just kind of the macro level? Uh, I, I, I personally am getting the hell out of um, equities. I'm getting away from liquid investments. I've gotten rid of all my NFTs. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I don't like equities. Equities are too volatile. They're going to take it on the chin. They'll continue to get hit. I, me personally, I'm rolling. I've been rolling into into real estate. Now, that's where I like to be right now. Well, leverage real estate because, well, at least up till now, interest rates have been pretty low, and you know it's a good deal <laughs> to be locked in at low interest rates. It's a little harder to do that now, but that's what I've been rolling into: more hard assets. Um. You know, one of the honor route comes in here, again, goes back to the dollar, it, it, the dollar going up. I, I it, This this is putting a, a crimp on exports, probably not part of the problem as well. I don't know why the dollar's up. Maybe it's the, you know, the, the carry trade, as they say, where, you know, it's just that interest rates are rising faster here in other places. Um, I've heard people say the dollar's going to come up for a while. I, I don't know, but it's it's certainly says, suggests that, the rest of the world was giving us space, even though we don't really don't deserve it. Now, will consumers get hit by interest rates and inflation? Where where is consumer? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a question um, regarding maybe raising the federal minimum wage. Would how, how right. do? They, but that's something I expect them to do due to the political narrative. Okay, well, I mean, as long as they if they actually get get it raised, it's, it won't even be functional. Mm. Right. I mean, yeah. I got a call the other day. Uh, I don't mean more than the other day, maybe seven, eight, nine months ago. And West Hollywood was planning on raising the minimum wage in West Hollywood to like eighteen dollars an hour. Yeah. And the chamber was like, "You got to help us. You got to help us." I go, "I don't think you need help." And they and I said, "Why?" I said, "Have you called any of your hotels or restaurants? Why?" I said, "Go go ask them if they can hire people at eighteen dollars an hour right now." And they call me back. Yeah, you're right. Nobody's paying $18 an hour. They're paying more than that already. Because <laughs> there's nobody out there. I showed you the data. Yeah. That's there's nobody available. It's The minimum wages are not. Well, this wage board in AB 257 is a whole separate conversation. That's that's a in different degree of insanity. But we won't, I don't want to go there. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's not that big of a deal. Okay. It's not. It's not. It doesn't matter. Because we're wages are already going up. Sure. You know, for all the conversation here that people are falling behind, they're not. And to be clear, again, let's let's go through this. Can consumers keep going? Can consumers survive inflation and higher interest rates? The answer is hell yeah. And look at these numbers. This is a household savings rate. For, for all the chaos over the last few months of inflation and everything else, savings rates are still 5%. That means that they're only spending 95% of their income. 5% is just getting tucked away. That's better than it was at any time in the run for the Great Recession. And look at this net worth. This is the fourth quarter of 2019, the second quarter of this particular year. This is the increase. Overall, there's been $27 trillion of new household net worth in nominal terms in, in, in less than three years. Now, where is that coming from? $9.5 trillion of that is in household equity. $9.5 trillion in pure cash sitting there in people's homes. Cash? 5.1 trillion higher than it was. This is just checking account balances. What do I show you this? I have a graph just for this. $5 trillion in excess cash. Uh, proprietors equity, $4 trillion. Equities, even with the sell-off in the market, the amount of cash sitting in equities is still $4.3 trillion higher than it was before. Overall, for this $27 trillion of new net worth, they've only picked up $22.4 trillion in, in debt over the last two years. People are sitting in gobs of cash. Look at this number. <laughs> this is household cash balances. This is checking accounts and short, very short-term deposits. Prior to the pandemic, $1 trillion. Now there's $4.7 trillion in cold, hard cash sitting in household checking accounts right now. Yeah, they can handle higher interest rates. They're fine. Um, financial obligations ratio. Yes, higher than it was for the last couple of quarters, but outside the chaos of the pandemic, still the lowest it's ever been. 
again, from this perspective, they're fine. Now, this is this is again, this is brand new stuff. This is out of the New York Fed Consumer Credit. You can see accounts. What's interesting here is, for example, ELOCs continuing to fall. But my guess is people are going to just want to start uh, accessing those yet again. Mortgages just starting to rise, but barely. Credit cards are starting to go up again, but auto loans are actually going down. So the actual number of loans is still going down because people have so much cash. Actually, I think you're going to have more lending opportunities in the next few years because people will start turning to debt as they start running out of cash, as the case may be. So there may be some opportunities. You might be able to make some lending at these higher interest rates. Hopefully that'll help. Household debt is still, again, has not grown over the last couple of years. You're just going to start seeing demand for that going up now because, again, some of that some of that cash is getting ebbed away. As for the banking client, this is from the uh, senior loan officer survey uh, for consumer loans. They were loosening right now. They're not tightening. So, again, the this is this is commercial banks, not the credit unions. But the commercial banks aren't tightening on consumer loans. They're still comfortable in that particular realm. Uh, in terms of uh, residential mortgage loans, yet again, tightening, not really, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. It's certainly not loosening anymore, but they haven't tightened very much. Where the banks seem to be getting scared is commercial real estate. That is where they're cranking down on their standards. Commercial real estate is scaring the banking world right now, and they're backing off. I think they're over-responding, although there's no doubt the commercial world yet again is going through, uh, well, there's a big sticker shot going on here. And then last but not least for CNI loans, there's some tightening there as well. So it's interesting seeing where, where the banking system is moving on this thing. Well, what's your logic about the commercial real estate? I'm interested to know. And I, you know, yeah, CNI is active, but it seems uh, the real estate for the commercial is also. Well, think of it this way. Your standard mortgage loan is 30 year fixed. Your standard commercial loan is five year balloon. Mm -hmm. All right. yeah, good point. Yeah. So, you know, it makes a difference. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, also, aren't buildings sort of emptier these days? People still working with law firms, not really investing in five floors in a traditional. <laughs> I've heard so much weird information stories about office and, and everything else. I mean, industrial is still hot, but obviously at some point, Tom's got to start cooling off um, because a lot of that heat was just driven by the crazy surge in goods, which is now going back towards a surge in spending on services, right? So that'll cool it off at some level. Um, offices, overall, it seems like the office sector is soft. There's no doubt about it. But some parts of the office market tend to be really in demand. We just moved offices. We moved offices. We were over by the air, airport. We realized that for just to, for staff, for recruiting purposes, we needed a nicer space. We moved over on Fairfax. We're across from the farmer's market. And our building over there, tons of demand. Every, it, when we moved in, it was empty. Now every space in the building is actually getting upgraded right now for people moving in. And we're talking to landlords. There's a huge demand to be around there. So I think what's happening is businesses are reestablishing. They want to go back in. They are bringing their people in. Even if a hybrid mix, you still need space. And there's a demand to be in good space. It's the B and C stuff that's really going to take it on the chin here. You're going to see a transfer to what I would call. There's going to be a small amount of demand for space. but They're really going to want the nice stuff. If I'm going to have a smaller space, I want nice space. And it's the, like I said, it's the B and particularly the C office, like my old office. <laughs> where you're gonna where you're gonna see the pain. But at this point in time, you know, it's gonna it's gonna shake out over time. Office guys, unlike retail, office can shutter half their offices and as long as they're cash flow positive, they're fine. They don't care. They'll figure it out eventually what to do with it. And a lot of them are. You know, they're, they're relatively subtle. So there's not a lot of debt out there. I don't see a huge risk. I don't see, you know, maybe some mezzanines guys might get themselves in a little bit of trouble. But I don't see it. I don't see it turning into anything systemic. Um, how about housing? We're talking about housing. But I have my guy who said, can you give me all of Mark Zandi's quotes on housing? It's going back to 2017. And uh, yeah, basically every quote Zandi's had on housing since 2017, he's telling us how housing is going to collapse any second now. Um, it, it's just hysterical, right? I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that just makes me crazy. So no matter what, tell everybody how terrible it's going to be. 
Now, there's no doubt residential markets are cooling up hard. This is existing home sales of that heat firing down uh, month over month price changes. Finally, they went negative yeah, after growing. This is monthly changes. Year over year, they're still way up. But this last month, you finally saw a decline in prices. Um, California, again, really strong markets. Prices have gone up steadily, but things are starting to cool off here, as the case may be. Permits are, are starting to take it as well. Multifamily are doing fine, but the single family are cooling off. And of course, there's been a huge surge in the month's supply of, of new homes for sale. Housing looks pretty scary. Um, but what is driving it? And of course, it's sticker shock. And the sticker shock is intriguing because, yes, some of the sticker shock is coming from, from mortgages, right? Mortgage payments. This is, for example, a new home cost, annual payment, 100% LDV. And, you know, it was 15000 Now it's about 25000 so, yeah, people are, are dealing with the sticker shock of that higher interest rate. But the sticker shock's a little bit different than just the interest rate. And I don't think people are appreciating that. This is inflation rates over the last five years. In the last five years, we've had about a 16% increase in consumer prices. This is from the official GDP statistics. The cost of residential has gone up 42%. What we don't appreciate is how much more prices for building homes has gone up compared to other parts of the consumption basket. Americans haven't been paying attention because interest rates are slow. Let's offset it. Well, who cares if expensive? Because I get this great subsidized interest rate courtesy of the Federal Reserve. Well, it's no longer subsidized. Mortgage rates are coming close to 7%. When suddenly Americans are starting to internalize it, guess what? Housing is actually really expensive. It's gotten really expensive to build. Labor costs more, lumber costs more, everything costs more. And it's hard to get a cruise and it's hard to get your supplies. It's expensive. And now, bam, we're getting hit in the face with that particular reality. Housing is now expensive. But is this market going to collapse? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Oh, well, by the way, I should point out also California. What's interesting is typically if we have a real real estate bubble, California is the worst. <laughs> We love real estate bubbles, and thus we suffer from the worst real estate crashes. This time, it's not us. This is the whole country going through exactly the same thing. There's nothing unusual about California in this particular one, which I kind of like. Now, here's the key. Well, in the short run, there's this huge sticker shock. From a long-run perspective, the fundamentals are amazing. You take, for example, home ownership rates, which had peaked prior to the Great Recession, collapsed, and now we're, we're starting to climb back up again. They were getting close to 66%, which outside of this surge, highest level ever. There's still a lot of demand to get houses right now. A lot of people, again, are taking a step back because the price is there. We had a very conservative cycle in terms of building over this last expansion. And as a result of that, vacancy rates, which had hit a record high after the Great Recession, came down, 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 down. And indeed, prior to the pandemic, were about as low as they had ever been, at least since 1992. And then in the pandemic, they went down even more because people spread out and reabsorbed a lot of that empty space. So there's not a lot of supply out there. And of course, as for financial fundamentals, I already noted to you that we had like, oh, God, in the last just a couple of years, $9 trillion in new housing equity. Uh, overall, to put this in its context, there's $28 trillion in household equity in the U.S. housing market as of the second quarter of the year. $28 trillion. Context, in 2011, 2010, it was $10 trillion. And this is inflation adjusted, by the way, to give you some context. So in less than a decade, or about a decade, real equity levels have tripled in the United States. That's an enormous cushion. Uh, at the Pacific Coast Builder Conference, Ivy Zellman also taught. You everybody know Ivy, Ivy Zellman? She's also known as Poison Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> because every forecast she's ever said is the housing market's going to collapse. That's exactly what she got up there and said. Oh, it's going to be a big spike in foreclosures. No, there's not. <laughs> there be any foreclosures. What are you talking about? With this kind of equity? Of course not. And then last but not least, sir. Uh, is the equity value in the homes across the board the same, or is it much bigger in California than in other states? So the actual equity levels? I never actually figured that out. 
seems like the you know, wonderful price is here compared to yeah uh, um we have more mortgage debt but we have a lot more mortgage value i don't know i have to sit down and figure out that would be a little bit of an intense calculation but i think i could probably do it you could do it you could do it yeah yeah you could do it um what i do know is the other thing is this is yes there's a big supply of new homes for sale right 11 month supply i already showed you existing homes three months supply there is no excess supply this goes back to what i was saying about the very conservative cycle whether you're talking about year-round vacant or for sale for rent in the market in 2022 is not 20, 2012 or 2008 there's not supply out there yet again what's the problem right uh, the real issue, you know, it's interesting, we, the saving grace during the course of the pandemic, and I'm still trying to figure this one out, but we saw a big decline in population per household in the pandemic, and it hasn't reversed itself. <laughs> Seems like the population spread out a little bit. One or two things happened here, okay? When this came down very strongly, this is either reflecting all the, all the grandparents who, shall we say, departed, um, or equivalently, some combination of people spreading out more. Maybe going farther afield, you know. Oh, I was living downtown with my friend, but now I got my I'm working remotely and I got myself a place out in Sacramento. I don't know what it is, but what I know is we absorb and the housing stock is even tighter than ever before. If you if I told those guys, you know, in this in this Pacific Coast Builder Conference, short run, you have a problem, interest rates. Medium term, you have no problem because there's no supply. In the long run, your real problem is this collapse in population growth I was talking about. Because demand for new homes depends on growth in population. And if our population is slowing down, well, there's the long run problem you're facing. But the medium term, things look fine because of that supply. And you certainly, of course, see it in the context of these rental markets where big growth in asking rents, declines in vacancies, huge amount of 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 uh of new demand for housing by the way the state is yet again you're going to start seeing this over the next year or two there's going to be a big push for rent control big what? push for rent control do you again. agree with that What's that do you agree with oh, rent control rent control is horrible mm -hmm. I mean, right off the bat why well people are getting crushed by rent no 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 time out i have to constantly explain this to people if you want to talk about competitive markets there's not much more of a competitive market than multifamily. Okay. There's no, there's not some smoke filled room where there's a few fat cats with their big stogie cigars going, ah, we'll get them this time. <laughs> and you're talking about a market that is made up of hundreds of thousands of owners, big and small, mom and pops to major international corporations that don't communicate or cooperate in any way, shape, or form. If rents are going up this rapidly, it can only be because of a big increase in demand. Why is there a big increase in demand? Because the wealth of the bottom 50% of the pyramid has gone up by over 100% in the last three years. Because earnings growth for low-income households is growing fastest it has in 50 years. This is why rents are going up. It's a function of demand, not supply. Now, yes, if you happen to be on a fixed income, you're in trouble in California. And one of the issues here is you're going to hear sad stories because inflation does create unequal outcomes. Some people are going to benefit and some people are going to get hurt. And you're going to hear all about the people getting hurt. What you're not hearing about is the legions of people who are being benefited by the trends in our economy today. And they are the ones driving these numbers up. So yet again, even on the multifamily front, I don't see any problems. Because... In the fun fundamentals are there, even if interest rates are coming up. Simple as that. Um, the, what's going to happen in residential real estate over the next couple of years as a result of the hiking increase is simply a frozen market, not a collapsing market, but a frozen market. The 1970s are a good representation of this, that the market just freezes because people aren't moving. No one wants to get rid of their two and a half percent mortgage. They're going to avoid moving as much as they can. The filtering system where people buy a nicer house and move out of the new one is going to slow down tremendously. And yeah, the top end is going to have a tough time because no one's going to move up. No one's going to be going there. But there's a huge amount of demand at the bottom end because of the lack of supply. So where can you make money in this market? Well, apartments. Building apartments is still going to be a good business. And if the costs are up, but it's still a good business. And as for builders, I said, look, there's a phenomenal desire to get into owning homes 
when homes are expensive because of rates, when homes are expensive because of the cost of construction, what do you do? You figure out how to make cheap units again. Lots of units per acre, townhouses, remember those? Condos, remember those? They exist. There are ways of dealing with this, but you got to be clever. You got to maneuver around the market. But the overall market is going to be pretty cool. Now, the bigger, long run issue here as we're going down this bumpy path is the federal debt situation. And as noted, 20,000 in two years, 50,000, 60,000 in 20, we still have an, an enormous $1 to $1.5 trillion deficit. A lot of it depends on the revenue outcomes of this. Um, uh, what do they call it? The inflation. What is it? The, the incredibly ironically named Inflation Act. What do they just call this thing? Inflation Reduction Act. But it is, I mean, it's just so stupid. <laughs> you call it the uh, Fury Godmother Act, you know. Um, but, no, no, no. <laughs> but again, we're, we're borrowing as if there's no limit to the amount we can borrow. We have 120% debt to GDP. At the start of this century, we had 60% debt to GDP. We're going to a period of time where because of the increased spending of Medicare and Social Security, you're already going to see a huge increase in outstanding debt. What is the limit? And of course, what makes this a little scarier in the short run is when you recognize that the reason they've been able to borrow so much debt is the federal government has been free riding on low interest rates like the rest of the economy has. For all the new debt, federal interest payments as a percent of GDP have remained about two and a half percent of GDP, which is, by the way, about half, a little less over half of what it was during Reagan's term, because Reagan was dealing with much higher interest rates, although he had a much smaller deficit. But now interest rates are going up. They're not just going up for homes, not just going up for cars. They're going up for these guys. Of course, what that means is start with the idea they have a 1.4, 1.3, 1.5, I don't know, trillion dollar structural deficit. Well, what happens when the cost of that debt starts to go up? Well, that's going to make spending go up all by itself without any increases in federal programs and defense spending or Medicare spending or infrastructure spending, all the other stuff they like to spend money on. And that's, of course, going to make the deficit that much wider, which is going to cause more debt buildup, which is going to cause debt burdens to grow even faster. And it becomes more and more intense, particularly when you realize that the half-life of government debt's about five years. In five years, half of all the out, outstanding existing debt, you're talking something on the order of uh, 60% of uh, $25 trillion. You're talking about $15 billion, trillion dollars of debt that's going to have to be refinanced at much higher interest rates. So you're going to see this deficit get wider and wider and wider. And the question is, is when do the markets blink? No, I don't know. Not right now. Again, the dollar's up. The dollar's up says the rest of the world is perfectly happy to buy our treasuries, even though the interest rate is negative and clearly our government is on an unsustainable borrowing path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you very much. We should send them a flowers and candy and say, sorry, suckers. <laughs> um, but we appreciate it. But when does that come to an end? And is it a political end or is it a financial end? How ugly does it look? What kind of battles are we talking about? None of this I know. I, I really don't have an answer to you. Look, we're not the biggest economy in the world, but we're still financially by far and away the most important economy in the world. And it is unclear to me when global bond markets go, I can't do this anymore. Greece, we all know, has a much shorter distance before that chain yanks. When our chain yanks, you better be ready to duck. You ought to run for office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. There's, yep. Here's, here's my platform. Stop whining. You're a bunch of whiny little brats. Stop complaining. And then be just be just wake up in the morning, frost yourself, and thank whatever you believe in that you were born as an American or were living as an American. Okay. Just shut up. <laughs> Not gonna work. <laughs> Not going to work. Oh, and then, of course, let's not forget our Gavin, who's sending out checks while they're announcing that their budget is down 8% already. 
Shocked. Shocked I am. Shocked. <laughs> so our state yet again is about to hit the hard rocks of fiscal problems. Ours is going to be much quicker than the, than the federal level. Uh, so, um, uh, <laughs> the economy was all right. It was fine. The V was the only logical outcome. Yes, the recovery was hampered by a lack of supply. The big problem was, of course, the overreaction, the overuse of stimulus. The inflation we're seeing is being caused by consumers, that hurting consumers. And all this global, global geopolitics is nothing but a dangerous distraction that is allowing us far more slack than we really should be being given at this particular point in time. As for the outlook, the expansion is going to continue. It's not going to be as hot as it was last year. Last year was 6%. This year, we're going to be bouncing along around zero, maybe a little bit above. Uh, construction is going to go into a deep freeze. You know that the, the debt markets are going to be struggling to figure out these higher interest rates. There's no doubt about that. But there's so much pent-up consumer demand. And they're going to be driving it off of cash now. And as time goes on, they're going to go, and go out and borrow some. So I actually think that, that you're going to find consumer debt markets are going to be okay. You're going to be able to do business. Not as much maybe as you were a year ago, but you know, there'll be more demand for money because there'll be more demand for it, but there'll be less demand for money because of the higher cost. But in that, you may find yourself more or less doing the same amount of business as you were doing before, maybe even a little bit more as the case may be. The thing about this economy over the next couple of years is it's a brittle economy. You got to worry about those unknown shocks, the things you weren't quite anticipating, because those will have an outsized effect. I like to point out in the mid 70s, we had the oil shock. And one of the things I never quite figured out about the OPEC oil shock is why did it hit our economy so hard in that mid 70s period? It didn't really make any sense for that thing to be as ugly as it was until you recognize that an inflationary economy is a brittle economy and shocks to the system become magnified and thus have a much larger overall impact. So we're a brittle economy, although we're not going to fall into recession. Will we fall into the recession over the next year, year and a half or so? The one thing that really could cause us to go into a recession in 2023 is that the Federal Reserve continues down this ridiculous path of trying to fight inflation by cranking up rates. You could cause enough damage to construction and the financial market. But if it, banks are going to be sensitive to these rates and hike rate hikes, particularly if they have por portfolios of relatively low interest rates, they could get hit. And suddenly you start to see, you know, credit becoming harder to get. And if that happens, it could have spillover effects. So yeah, you could cause a recession. Stop, stop, stop trying to help because you're not. <laughs> Just stop. Sit in your hands. Um, the best thing they could do is let, let, let it burn out on its own. Maybe they will. I, I don't know. I can't possibly tell you. Let's give me a little wrap up and over QA. Um, as for the wild cards, a couple of wild cards here. I mean, first of all, let's remember that while consumers are in good financial shape right now, there's no doubt our, our economy is, is overspending. The trade deficit is 5% of GDP. Okay. One way or the other, we're overspending. How much excess will build up while we're overspending? How much of that will come back to haunt us? Not quite sure. What about the bond market and the fiscal situation? When will bond markets flinch? What does that mean? I don't know. You have the global markets and the US dollar. The dollar's going up. Again, when do they look at us and go, yeah, maybe you aren't all that good? <laughs> and then the dollar starts dropping. And how does that create potential shocks in our economy? And then last but not least, let's say it out loud. Politics is no less crazy now than it was two years ago or four years ago or six years ago. It's crazier. I, I, every time I, I, I read a story about someone in Congress, I just want to go someplace and cry. Because <laughs> it, 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 I mean, honestly, it's, 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 it's not just that they're radicalized. I mean, the people, and particularly in Congress, the people who are being elected are stupid. <laughs> they're just stupid. And that's scary. I mean, uh, is that do you mean to say? Am I not? Am I not? Is that you can say that? So. No, you're not. All right, fair enough. I, I just, 
I, I've never seen anything like it. I, I don't know where this goes. I really don't. Um, this election, next election, election cycles are going to be crazy. And, you know, if I, the rest of my election campaign, campaign is, is this. <laughs> Settle down, people. <laughs> it is, it, it, the guy on the other party is not your enemy. It's that guy running Russia. He's the guy you should be worried about. We have far more in common than we have difference. The press is our enemy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and for the record, politics is the art of compromise. If you're a politician, it's because you're good at figuring out how to create deals in a complex, conflicting environment. We're electing people who are going to go in promising to not make a deal. It's kind of a bad idea. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah. So there it is. Thank you so much. I think we have some questions from our Zoom audience. Maybe yeah, we could sure. take those first and then well, see if there's other questions in the room. Well, then there's a couple back here. Absolutely. But you want to do the, the online stuff first? Maybe we do. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we heard you speak a few months ago up in Monterey. A lot has happened since then in the financial markets and stock market. Have reviews changed drastically in a few months? And what big indicators will you use to forecast things and interest rates? Um, well, I think... Wrapping it up, I don't think my views have changed that much. Um, obviously, back then I was talking about an economy that still had a little momentum. I think that momentum. We look back then. I was worried about the consequences of interest rates rapidly rising. Now they have. Now it's happened. <laughs> so that's behind us. Question is: Is how is the economy going to respond? What should the Federal Reserve do? I think my my views have changed there. One of my views has strongly changed. Is is again my views on Fed policy. I mean, a couple. Of, 18 months ago, 12 months ago, I would have been quantitative type, quantitative type, quantitative type. Now sit in your hands. It's too late. You're going to do more, more harm than good at this point in time. You just have to run it out. So that, that's one of the bigger views. Um, but now I, I'm still in opinion that this economy is not in a recession. It's not going to go into recession into the near future unless the Fed continues to do the horrible things the Fed is doing. Um, otherwise, we're just going to muddle along, again, banging around at, at this, you know, a little bit above 0% interest rate until things start to sort themselves out. Inflation will cure itself. And I think we just need to be patient and let that happen. Chris, are there a couple more online? Yeah, we have about four more. Great. Um, considering the idea of not a recession, what are your thoughts on current stock market valuations and future trends? The stock market's still overvalued. P ratios are still too high. That's one of the reasons I've been getting out of liquidity. Stock market doesn't make any sense. Um, so no, I don't like it. I, I, I'm getting out of stocks. Now, where is it going to go? Don't ask me. I mean, it's, you know, I always like, but I have, I'll say it as I always say, if I really knew where the stock market was going, would I be staying here, here talking to you guys? Would I? No, I'd be on my private island, you know, the one right next door to Jeffrey Epstein's. <laughs> I didn't say I was hanging with him. Come on. I said it was next to his. Uh, so if there's no recession and demand is high, but shouldn't, then shouldn't corporations do well? And that's why the advice to get out of equities. Well, corporations have done very well. A lot of the money has gone through and, and gone landed in corporate profits. I didn't get the corporate profit number this morning, but corporate profits are going to start suffering a bit. Remember, corporations are now having less ability to price of whatever they want. Right, because inflation is coming up and all this kind of stuff, and at the same time, they got a big increase in labor costs they got to deal with. So I think corporate profits are going to start softening, and um, I don't think they're going to collapse. But again, I, I mean, look, predicting the stock market is kind of a fool's game. I just I don't like it right now, and I'm going to dodge for a while. But it could go up again. Again, go back to the idea about what's a crazy person going to say next. Did you have one more? Uh, two more. Okay. If a 4 to 4.5% federal funds rate is too much by late 2022, what would have been a more appropriate action, half that amount or something else? I wouldn't have done much to the federal funds rate at all. I would have gone to quantitative tightening. They should have been selling off bonds and absorbing some of the cash in the economy. But it's too late now. Uh, the, the, the horse is out of the barn. You got to let it go. You know, he, he, you know, if, if, if QE giveth, QE should take it away. And, 
And that's that, you know, you, you, you know, it, it, the best way I can describe it is, you know, he, he put a rocket thruster to get the economy going. And now he's trying to slow it down with his bicycle brake. <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense. And the last question is for a first time home buyer, is it better to buy a house now or wait till next year or. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I mean, you're buying in a relatively high mortgage rates in a market that has not absorbed the reality of the overpricing problem. Sellers are always remarkably resistant to accept the fact that nominal the nominal value of their property has gone down and they're going to be stubborn. Um, if I was truly in the market for a first time home, um, I would be, I would probably drag my feet. I would. And I would probably wait and see if I could find a killer deal. Because um, they will be out there here and there. Uh, but I think this is a good time to relax and see how things play out. Yeah. Any other questions from our in person audience? This has been a great presentation. And, and, and glad it's not with hundreds and hundreds of people, you know. Yeah. I'm glad you're enjoying it. This is, this is a great presentation. Reality. Thank yeah. you. Any Reality. other questions? Well, um, oh, yes, sir. Do you see, I, I've been hearing in a lot of industries of possible uh, contractions of hiring and stuff like that. Do you see that in what? the future? I know you're saying that there's still a lot of jobs out there, but I've been, I've been hearing, job openings. But I hear a lot of companies talking about layoffs and that. Now, what you hear is this typical miserableist nonsense that the papers seem to specialize in talking about. Right. I, I honestly, I, I used to be like a huge supporter of, of NPR, and I can't listen to NPR anymore. <laughs> I, I just can't. The other day I turned on NPR and they were wagging a finger at Joe Biden because he said the pandemic was over. Oh, I can't believe he said the pandemic was over. Oh. Yeah. Back to classic rock. Oh, the who? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Something that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's it is a it is a very strange world when our nation is sitting around in the midst of this national pity party. When, without a doubt, the private sector, sector fundamentals have never been stronger than they are right now, and we're dealing only with public sector excesses, as the case may be, I, I don't know how you reconcile that, and um, I don't understand how Americans can have so little context, so little context. I mean, I, I had I had some twenty-seven-year-olds walk up to me at an event not too long ago, and they wanted me to help them. Um, they're like, oh, this is really interesting. We really appreciate it. I wonder if we could reach out to you. you might give us some help on a, on a, on a report on, on the thing we're writing. Sure, what's it on? Well, it's about how millennials are, are just basically getting, I'm paraphrasing, but are getting shafted. Yeah, you know, it's just we're never going to be able to buy a house. I said, how old are you guys? Oh, we're 27. They say, tell you what, I'm going to help you. I am. You can, here's my email. What I want you to do is I want you to go and tell me when it was an easy for a 27-year-old to buy a house in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. You tell me when that was easy, and they all looked at me like, "Huh?" They go, "Just tell me." You was it my? It wasn't my generation. It was it? Was certainly one generation before me. So, so when? When? When was it easy for a twenty-seven-year-old to buy a house? Stop it! <laughs> and by the way, I didn't have an iPhone. <laughs> Last question, yes, sir. So it seems like the market's built in a certain number of rate hikes in a certain period of time, right? And at some point, it's going to stop. It's going to peak. Do you have any sense of how long that peak will remain before they start cutting rates or doing something? Else? You know, he'll pr they'll probably overdo it and then immediately have to start cutting again because the economy is going to show signs of gassing, and and he's going to be have to turn around and, and start loosening up again. Now, how much will the rest of the curve come down with it? That's one of the bigger questions, right? Will the rest of the curve will will, will the curve just get spread, or will other rates start to come down with it? My belief is, my feeling is, what's going to happen here is when rates, when they do start cutting, the yield curve is going to spread. I don't think long-run rates are going to come down that much. I think they're going to stay elevated for a while. Because you got to remember that there are a lot of savers who are getting absolutely... The dirty old story 
A dirty old story I heard years and years, and I, I always poo-pooed it. I said, that's not how the world works. But I always used to say, you'll wait, you'll see, you'll see. All that government debt, they're just going to inflate it away. Oh, no, 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 we have an independent federal reserve, so they can't do that. You'll see. They're kind of doing it. <laughs> I mean, uh, they, although our federal government is borrowing pretty damn quick, but they really are shrinking the existing debt in real terms because inflation is getting really higher than those interest rates. So what that means is a whole bunch of savers out there somewhere in the system, somewhere in this global system is a bunch of savers getting absolutely shafted. And that has to come back in the form of higher interest rates, ultimately. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate that you, you, you said about uh, rates, they're already coming up. The, you know, and I think that one of the challenges that the financial institutions have is that they typically lend long and borrow short, borrow from their consumers. And, and that's already beginning to have, it, have a tremendous impact. So I have a feeling that you're going to see a little bit of tightening in terms of, of borrowing because the capacity is not there. And, and uh, you're going to see the savers are going to actually start benefiting. You know, so, uh, you know, so uh, I think uh, we're very interesting for our business, which is business, you know, and I'm talking about financial services. I think we're in a, a bit of a, uh, you know, bigger, as you said, the brakes are really hurting this, uh, this uh, segment. And I think that as that uh, pressure is felt, it could have repercussions for the rest of the economy uh, because everybody's kind of sort of depending on their financial institution one way or another. But as always, you know, riveting, you know, I, you know, you know, I, and uh, uh, this year uh, I, 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 I didn't know if I should start crying or laughing or what, you know, but, uh, but I've got all those, uh, all those, uh, all those feelings. But once again, you know, you helped us you know, see some, uh, the fundamentals in a way that I think uh, we rarely hear. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.